I, I sure do love that song. Uh, it's been one of my favorite for an awful long time. I, uh, I know that many of you enjoy it just as much as I do, but isn't the message true? The, the church is trusted with the uh, awesome responsibility to take the message to the world, and so we must be a people that ring it out. Great song, Brother Ron. 934 will be our song of invitation. Let me encourage you to mark that in your songbook. And then if you have your sermon uh, uh, supplement with you, if you open it up, you'll see our uh, second part of our lesson this evening on spirit and truth worship. This morning, if you notice there on the screen behind me, we looked at several aspects of uh, spirit in our worship. Uh, we're talking about the proper attitude when we talk about uh, spirit as we come into the presence of God. And we talked about having a spirit that has a desire in worship and gratitude in worship and reverence in worship and a realization in worship that God is present. And uh, these things ought to encourage our spirit. I, I would go so far as to say this, church, that these things should bring excitement uh, to our spirit. When we talk about having that proper attitude as we come into the presence of God, um, these areas that we talked about this morning kind of bring that excitement. They kind of uh, give us the understanding what a wonderful privilege we have to come into the presence of God and worship Him. Well, we're going to continue that thought tonight in part two. And we're going to talk about truth in worship. Again, we'll be using John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 as our uh, uh, primary text. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Just a, a few things as we begin. You know, this is one of those topics, um, worship, that it's good for us from time to time to come back to and to look uh, intently into it and make sure that we have a firm understanding of what God's Word is saying. But I'm well aware that it is a, uh, an issue today that for many can be difficult. Um, there are many that struggle with the idea of spirit and truth worship. So I, I want you to know that I'm sensitive to that. I want you to know that I understand that there are people um, in the Lord's church, in, our, in, in the brotherhood, who are wrestling with this concept. And in bringing a message such as this, my intent and purpose is, one, to, to look into what God's Word says, and two, to encourage them to follow along in obedience to what God's Word said. But I, I understand that it can be difficult for, for many folks. There is um, this idea that, that change is always good. We kind of talked about this this morning, that our worship must evolve as we evolve as a people. And if it stays the same, this simple pattern of worship, that it, it can't be good. It, it can't be appealing to the masses out there. So we begin to have this struggle. And I know that not everybody is on the same page in the Lord's church with me on that. I, I spend enough time on social media that um, I hear a few things about myself from time to time. Uh, if you're on social media enough, you'll hear a few things about yourself uh, from time to time. But one of the things that I hear in reference to my preaching and my teaching, uh, and I've come across this a sev several times, is the, the thing that people say, what does Brother Gellis' haircut and his preaching have in common? They're both stuck in 1950. I hear it. I understand. I know where people stand. What do they mean? I sure wish he would change. It's a good haircut. That's what they mean. <laughs> I sure wish that Brother Gellis would evolve in his preaching and teaching on the area of worship. I sure wish he would move forward. And I know that as I have preached and I have taught on this topic, I know that I have incurred the wrath of certain individuals within the brotherhood, and I feel bad about that. Because I do believe that there needs to be unity among the Lord's church when it comes to the pattern of New Testament worship. Um, and, and so it, it does grieve me that that, that type of um, um, fracture can exist between uh, brothers and sisters in, in Christ. But you know, ultimately, we always have to turn back to the Word of God and say, what authority do we have? What has God revealed to us? And if we are not a people who are willing to go back to the pages of Scripture and conform ourselves to what the Word of God says, instead of trying to make the Word of God conform to what we think, well, then we are a people to be pitied. Because God's Word is a standard by which we will be judged. John chapter 12, verse 48. And if we're not willing to do what His Word says when it comes to an area as, 
simply and as plainly taught in the New Testament is worship, then what other areas are we wrestling with in our relationship with God in that area of authority? Some people just want change. I understand that. I was talking to a fellow about change in worship several years ago, and I remember something that um, Brother Dave Miller had written in his book, and I, and I shared this with the individual, and I said, you know, uh, he was talking about all kinds of innovations that we need, all kinds of things that we need to freshen up our worship and new approaches and new ways to bring excitement to our worship. And I said, do you like Bluebell ice cream? He said, ah, absolutely, I love it. I said, do you, do you like uh, Big Macs? He said, well, all you have to do is look at me to tell that I love a Big Mac. I said, do you, do you like Starbucks coffee? <gasps> I will gladly wait in line for 20 minutes and pay $4 for a Starbucks coffee. I said, you know, all those things have one thing in common. And he said, what's that? Every time you purchase, whether it's Blue Bell ice cream, a Big Mac, or a Starbucks coffee, you want it to taste exactly the same. We're a people who understand that just because something is the same doesn't mean it's bad. I've seen people who have bit into a hamburger expecting it to taste a certain way, the way that it's always tasted, and they bite into it and there's something different, a different ingredient. Maybe they added mustard instead of mayonnaise, and they take that bite and they, they get that face. What? This is different. I've seen people bite into a Snickers bar that had long since expired, and it no longer tasted like a Snicker bar, like they expected it to taste. It changed. So we understand that when it comes to things always being the same, we're okay with that. We don't mind it. Why then is it, brethren, when it comes to our worship, we get this idea that it can never remain the same? That we just can't be a people who, who worship the same way today that our parents did, or our grandparents did, or their grandparents did. You see, it must be new and fresh and, and different. I would challenge that understanding if we begin to go in that direction to think that it always has to be the same. Let me share these words with you. Brother um, Dave Miller wrote them in his book, Piloting the Strait, and I think they give us a good uh, start to our lesson tonight. We're going to focus on truth and worship. And he said this, if, if worship has become boring and unmeaningful to a member, so much so that he feels the need to change churches or liven up the worship assembly with theatrics, he has a spiritual, internal problem, a heart problem. His restless discontent is more of a reflection of his own spiritual condition than the status of the worship assembly. Now, I don't say that in a in a, in a haughty way to be um, mean or, or vengeful towards those who are looking for change. But I think Brother Miller's right. And when we start looking at worship and we begin to see those among us who are saying, it can't be this simple, it can't remain this easy, it's an internal issue that they're wrestling with, not external. It's a heart issue that is at the, the very core of their struggle, not a scriptural issue. For the Bible lays out to us very clearly what is acceptable New Testament worship. So I think it's good for us to, mind, uh, to be mindful from time to time that when we begin to wrestle or hear people wrestling with the idea of worship, well, is it a scriptural thing that they're wrestling with? Or is it a personal, spiritual issue that they're wrestling with? Go back over with me to John chapter 4 and verse 23. We were there this morning. And we come to the understanding again, Jesus is doing the teaching. He says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must, do you see the imperative? Must worship in spirit and truth. Well, friends, I would have absolutely no biblical authority to stand before you tonight and say that you don't need spirit and truth in your worship. I would not be able to stand before you with one ounce of biblical authority and say that spirit and truth worship shouldn't matter to you because Jesus says the very opposite of that in John chapter 4 and verse 24. He says that it does matter. He says that those who worship him must worship. How? He doesn't stop there. There, there. There's no period in your verse. You can search through all the Greek manuscripts that you want to. The verse goes on. 
And Jesus doesn't come before us and say that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship. He identifies the type of worship. He gives it the boundaries that hem us in. And he says that we must worship in spirit and truth. Therefore, church, God has defined what our worship is to be like. God has set the boundaries that, hit, that limits us how far we can go as a people seeking to be pleasing in our worship to Him. I highlight a couple things there on your outline that I'll draw your attention to. Again, we talked about spirit this morning. We're talking about truth tonight, and that is our focus, truth and worship. And when we talk about truth, we're talking about uh, those things that deal with our instructions on what acceptable worship is. God has never called him uh, called to him a people of ignorance. He has never, in the patriarchal, in the mosaical, in the Christian dispensation, God has never called unto him a people who didn't know what he wanted, or who couldn't understand what he wanted, or who were not instructed to learn what he wanted. God has never called uh, to his bosom a people of biblical ignorance. He always teaches, instructs, and explains to us. And when we talk tonight about truth in our worship, we're talking about those very instructions that he's given to us. Those very things that you and I can follow and be held accountable to. I'll remind you of John 17 and verse 17 where Jesus says, Sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. So again, we begin to narrow down, what is my source of truth? What material do I pull from? What, what, is, what is it that should guide me in the area of truth? Jesus says that it's God's word that is truth. So now I understand that if I want to know truth from God, in this context, we're talking about truth and worship, but there's, a truth, there's truth in a multitude of ways and all the different ways in which we seek to be pleasing to God. But tonight we're looking at this one. So if I want to be pleasing to God, when it comes to truth and worship, I go to his word. John 17, 17. I turn to the pages of scripture and I say, what has God revealed to me through these inspired men? What is it that God would have me know about acceptable worship to, to him? What is his truth on the matter? Jesus tells us that truth is very powerful in our life, very liberating in our life. In John chapter 8 and verse 32, he says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Well, isn't that interesting? Isn't that contrary to what many people say in the world today? Why, you can't know truth? Well, there's no absolute truth. Well, you can't put your finger down on one verse and say, well, this is what God means. It's always in movement. It's always in flux. Well, no, that's not what Jesus said in John 17, 17. That's certainly not what he said in John 8 and verse 32. And that's not the understanding that we come to in Acts 2 and verse 42. Let me encourage you to go over there for, for just a moment, and I want you to notice what's being revealed to us here. You have the church in its infancy, and, and I think it's important for us to give note to that. You have the church beginning its worship of God. You have uh, the, this new covenant that has been brought in by the blood of Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of the old. You have the doing away with Jew and Gentile, free and slave, and you have this one new man in Christ. And it's so wonderfully pointed out to us that in Christ, as, as Christians, we become those spiritual heirs or the seed of Abraham. And we're made this one new man uh, in the body of Christ. So you have the church here in, in Acts chapter 2 in verse uh, 42. And they're in their infancy and they're coming together. And I want you to notice one of the things that was highlighted. It says this, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and the breaking of the bread, and in prayers. Isn't that interesting? The church as it was beginning to assemble together uh, held to a, 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 a source of truth. They held on to something that they believed would become for them patternistic, meaning that which they could continue to follow, that which would continue to give them guidance. And it says here that they continued steadfastly. This isn't half-heartedly. This isn't something that they could take or leave. This is something that they have latched onto as being essential to their relationship with God, certainly in their relationship with the church in its infancy. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Isn't that wonderful? I, I highlight that verse here, Acts 2 and verse 42. 
because some, when it comes to the idea of worship, have gotten the wrong notion that doctrine is a bad thing. And that we need to be careful that we don't become too latched on to doctrine. Yet here is the church in its infancy turning to the apostles who had been heralded as the leaders by Jesus himself to take the gospel to this new generation. And what do they do? They hold on to their very teaching. Why? Well, it's the teaching that's being given to these men through inspiration. As they are miraculously indwelt with the Holy Spirit and given a ready recollection of everything that Jesus had instructed to them and they deliver it to the church. And these men and women, this body of Christ upon receiving it, they hold steadfastly to the apostles' doctrine. Do we hold to the doctrine today? Are we willing to be a people who hold steadfastly to the apostles' doctrine? Now, friends, I know it's been said a, a multitude of times, and you've probably heard it in more sermons than you can remember, but I believe it's a saying that holds true. If these individuals could worship God acceptably in the first century, then you and I can worship God acceptably in the 21st century. And those who will come after us. And if the Lord tarry, those who come after them. And if the Lord still wait, those who come after them. That we can know based on the doctrine, the authority, the truth that has been delivered to us what is acceptable. I want you to notice how the, the, the truth of God's word, the truth of his doctrine is always the thing that should guide us. Uh, go back to Matthew chapter 15. We looked at it this morning. We looked at verse 8. I want you to notice verse 9. Verse 8, we, we looked at how people can come into the presence of God and worship Him, but their, they don't have the proper heart. They don't have the proper attitude. Remember, He says that they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Notice verse 9. He says, and in vain they worship me. Now the context is clearly worship. And in vain they worship me. Why? And in vain they worship me. Well, how is that possible? Jesus is doing the talking. And in vain they worship me. You mean there's a way that people can worship God that's not pleasing to Him? And in vain they worship me. How? Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus tells us that we can easily see the doctrines of God and the doctrines of man. That we can rightly divide between those two doctrines and know what is truth and be held to truth and in turn teach those around us what truth is. The problem today when we talk about the doctrines of men and the, uh, the, the, the uh, doctrines and the commandments of men is the understanding that there are far too many people today who are willing to latch on to those doctrines instead of the clear teachings from God's word. And you see it manifested, we're talking about truth. You see it manifested in a multitude of ways in the Lord's church. You see that people begin to determine what is truth based on not what God's word says, but, not on, uh, but, but on what they feel or what they think or what makes them happy or what is pleasing or what is popular. And that type of mentality, worship that says what do I want and not what God wants, Worship that begins to say, what do I want, has led into all sorts of things like instrumental music in the worship assembly, hand clapping in the worship assembly, baby dedication uh, uh, services in the worship assembly, uh, congregations wrestling with whether or not they should even serve communion on the first day of week, women preachers standing behind uh, the pulpit, women serving in elderships, praise teams leading the singing instead of congregation, congregational uh, 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 singing. There's a multitude of things that have worked their way into our worship because we are saying what are the doctrines and the commandments of men instead of what is the truth of God's word. And I would suggest to you, friends, that when we find ourselves wrestling with what is acceptable or unacceptable worship, the only way to answer that question isn't to ask your preacher, isn't to read what the latest book on worship is, it's to go back to the word of God and say what does God's word say? How did the first century church worship? What did they give themselves over to? When they looked at what truth was, John 17, 17, uh, John 8 and verse 32, when they held to the apostles' doctrine, Acts chapter 2 and, and verse 42, what did they hold to? What did they believe in? And am I doing that? If not, why am I not doing that? 
If I am, well, then I'm not going to let anybody discourage me from doing that. I want to highlight a couple of things tonight, and we'll work our way uh, through them as we did this morning. And, and again, the, the concept is truth, and, and there should be certain aspects of truth that are manifest in our worship to God. And here's the first one that I would suggest to you, that when we come before God, there should be authority in our worship. There should be authority for what we do. I, in my years of preaching, have never had a member come to me and say, Brother Gellis, I think you ought to wear a robe when you preach. Because they understand that there's no authority in the pages of Scripture for a preacher to wear a robe. I've never had anybody come to me and say, Brother Gellis, listen, I think you need to get one of those collared shirts that are symbolic as being a slave, yoked to God. That's what the collar represents. And I think you ought to wear one of those collars. I've never had anybody do that. Why? Because they understand that there's absolutely no authority within the pages of the New Testament for a preacher of the gospel to wear such things. And if we can go to the pages of Scripture and see that there's no authority in those areas, then certainly we can go to the pages of Scripture and see what authority is in worship. It's not that difficult. I want you to notice what, what is, uh, uh, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 and, and verse 17. He says these words, and, and whatever you do, now, I often get this, well, Brother Gellis, I mean, you're just narrowing that down to worship. Well, no, I'm not. I think Colossians 3 and verse 17 would cover when you go to work tomorrow. I think it'll cover whatever you do. And certainly you would agree that when we say whatever you do, that would mean worship as well, right? Well, sure. So Paul says this, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When something is expressed as being done in the name of, it means through the authority. Through the authority of that individual. And so what you have here is a good old classic uh, King James remindering of a thus saith the Lord. That when it comes to our authority and worship, we must have a thus saith the Lord. We must have an instruction from Him that authorizes ourselves to do a certain thing. Now, let me share with you one of the most common misconceptions that people have about worship. And here it is. They think that God will accept any type of worship that is offered to Him. It's based on a, faith, a false premise. But their understanding is, well, if we bang on a set of drums... If we run up and down the aisles, if we do tongue speaking, if we do healings, if we do, God will be pleased with anything that we offer Him because we're worshiping Him and He'll accept anything. Yet the Bible says that's not true. The Bible says that worship that is not offered to God through His authority with a thus saith the Lord understanding from Scripture, God doesn't have to accept. Well, we see it in, in different places. We've already looked at, at um, uh, Matthew chapter 15. We've seen verses 8 and 9. This, this vain worship. Well, sh nobody's doubting that these people didn't offer worship. Jesus is, is mentioning the very fact that they were worshiping God. But what does he say about it? It's vain. You don't have the proper attitude. You don't have the proper heart. You're worshiping according to the, to the, to the commandments of men, not the doctrine of God. So there we see that it's not true that God will accept every type of worship. He didn't accept uh, uh, vain worship. But we see, secondly, that God doesn't accept what we call will worship. Go back to the book of Colossians. Go to chapter 2. And I want you to notice these words in, in verse 23. Colossians 2 and verse 23. Paul says, These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. Some of you are reading from a translation that doesn't say self-imposed religion. You know what it says? Will worship. That there are those who come into the presence of God, he says, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. And it's the understanding that worship can be offered to God that is willful. It's what I want. It's what I think. It's what I desire. It's what will make me happy. It's the individual who comes into the worship service and says, Amaze me. Dazzle me. Entertain me. I want to walk out of here feeling different. 
Well, we talked about that this morning. If you don't come here with the proper spirit, we can't give it to you. Doesn't matter if we dim the lights. Doesn't matter if there's a group off to the side singing quietly. We can't manifest the proper spirit in you if you don't bring it with you. I want you to notice something else that Brother, Brother Miller shared with us. And I think he's right. He says this. Some, some churches of Christ are operating on the belief of an inappropriate, unbiblical objectives and goals in worship. We're talking about will worship and vain worship. And he says some churches have worship committees or praise teams who apparently have no clue as to what their real responsibility is to plan and structure worship so that the focus is on God, not the worshiper. Now, don't take this the wrong way, but we're not here for you. We're not here for me. We're here to step into the presence of God, and he is the focus, and he is the object of our worship. And sometimes we forget that. How? In keeping with the tone and tenor of our entertainment crazed culture, some in the church feel that the worship ought to be entertaining. Though they may not come out and describe their sentiments in this way, they go to great lengths to stimulate the tastes and the desires of the audience, which is a tacit omission that the focus is on the people. Can you imagine first century Christians going to such lengths to stimulate the crowd? Can you imagine them manipulating the lighting in the catacomb? Or perhaps placing a choir group behind a rock so that their singing could echo through the death chamber in an eerie, chilly fashion? Folks, can't we see that entertaining ourselves, satisfying our own needs, reviving our interests to escape our own boredom, and attempting to attract others with these man-made lures are all simply unbiblical, cheap and fear substitutes for simple unpretentious meaningful spiritual worship I, I think the brother's right not because he says so because what the word of God says and when we come back to the word of God we don't find any type of the presumptuous things that we dare bring into the presence of God today to say that, well, God will be pleasing with this because it makes me feel good. So? Well, God is going to like this because other people are going to be excited by it. So? The understanding is that we're coming in the presence of God, and since it is worship given to God, geared towards God, worship that God has asked for, John 4, 23 and 24, it needs to be worship that is done by His authority, according to what He says is right or wrong. And this concept forever needs to be removed from our mind that God will accept whatever worship we give him. Well, it's not true. Vain worship rejected. Will worship rejected. Acts chapter 17, 23 and 24. Ignorant worship, Paul says, is rejected. So it's not true that God will accept all worship given to him. He accepts that worship which is done according to his authority in the way that he is asked. Let me share a second point with you tonight. It's the understanding that when we come before God, and the concept is truth, remember, there should be order in our worship. There should be order in our worship. Go over for just a moment to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and notice these words that Paul says in verse 40. If you remember, Paul deals with a lot of different topics in his first epistle to the church there in Corinth. He deals with some immorality issues. He deals with some division issues. He deals with some worship issues. And he writes these things not in a way to, to harass or harm them, but in a way to encourage them to be committed and faithful and to honor God in a way that is proper and right. And so he covers all these different topics, and, and he covers things about worship. And, and I like what he says here in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, because it's a good reminder to us. And he says, let all things be done decently and in order. This concept of what I call modern-day worship free-for-alls is foreign to the New Testament church. Even when the church was endowed with those miraculous manifestations of the Holy Spirit, in which people did prophesy, in which people did speak in tongues, in which people were given that ability through the Holy Spirit to interpret those tongues, in which there was healing taking place miraculously in the first century. Paul gives us the understanding in 1 Corinthians 13 that those things would come to an end when the word of God was complete. 
That they would be of non-effect. That the church was in its infancy. And do you remember Paul making the connection? When I was a child, I spake as a child. I acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And he connects it to the growth of the church. When the church is in its infancy, it needs these things. Miracles, tongue speaking, prophecy. But when it becomes mature and has the word of God, it puts those things away. But even when those things existed in the first century, there was an order given to them. There was the understanding, and Paul deals with these things in his epistle to the Corinthians. There was an understanding that worship was not a free-for-all. While you just jump up and you start speaking whatever you want to speak, and you just get up and you start doing this, and you get up and you start healing these people, and you get up and doing this, there were, there were boundaries, limitations that were placed on the use and the, the, the uh, uh, exhibition of these spiritual gifts. I find it ironic then that there are those today who say there ought not to be any boundaries in the worship assembly. That when we come together, if a brother or sister has a movement of the spirit, why you let them jump up and fly around. When we come together, if a brother or sister has a word from the Lord that is swelling within their soul, let them shout it out. Yet even in the first century, Paul said, now wait a minute. If there's not somebody there to interpret, don't you say a thing. Now listen, if some of you are going to talk, one of you talks at a time. You wait, let somebody else go after you. But today there's this idea that we don't need to do things decently and in order. Why is that? Again, because we want to gear worship towards what excites us. And man, it's exciting to see that individual jumping up and shouting and running around. Wow, it feels like I've really been to, are you ready? Well, church. It feels like I was really moved in that service to see that sister doing this and that brother doing that. Yet the one thing that you don't find is any resemblance to that which is decent and orderly. A worship that is pleasing to God, that is done in truth, not only is done according to his authority through the word, but it's done decently. It's done orderly. Now I've preached long enough to be heckled from the pulpit. I've had it. <laughs> I've preached long enough to have to remove people from the auditorium because they wouldn't settle down, pay attention, and wouldn't stop disrupting the service. It happens. I understand. But we need to understand that when we come together as the body of Christ to worship God, that we first and foremost have the understanding that our worship needs to have an order to it. An order. Let me give you a third suggestion. It's the understanding that when we come before God, there should be intention in our worship. This might seem a little odd uh, to some of you who probably haven't heard this, but years ago we wrestled with this concept that all of life is worship. That everything you do is worship. And it, it swept through the, 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 the congregations very quickly and people latched onto it and they, and they did it and they believed this concept of all of life is worship because then it gave them an opportunity to change the worship service. Why, if all of life is worship and we have women out here speaking and teaching and all these things, well, then why can't they do it in here if all of life is worship? If all of life is worship and we're singing praises to God over here and banging on drums and hearing instrumental music, why can't we do it over there and not do it over here if all of life is worship? Because all of life isn't worship. Worship is intentional. Worship is something that has a direction and a focus and is offered to God. Let me give you an example. Go back to Genesis chapter 22. And this is just one. I'll give you a couple others, but I think this does a good job. And in Genesis chapter 22 in, in verse 5, I want you to notice the intentional worship, right? We preached on the story not too long ago about Abraham and Isaac, and it says this, And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and continue the worship that we've been doing since the moment we left. Some of you look confused. No. He says, Stay here with the donkey. Uh, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. It's the understanding that worship is intentional, that we intend to worship. And, and so you can have Abraham saying, listen, you wait here, I'm going over there to worship God. I'm going over there to step into the presence of God and offer something specific, worship. You see it in the Ethiopian eunuch who traveled all the way to worship God. 
You, 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 you have this idea, this concept that, that, that worship um, is just everything we do in life and it begins to lessen. It begins to tarnish that corporate time when we come together. All of life is not worship because everything that we do is not intended to be worship. Just because you're whistling a gospel song doesn't mean it's worship. I did a debate, it's called the Gellis Main Debate. I debated a, a fine brother in Christ. And his purpose, his intent was to prove that all of life is worship. And he said this thing in our debate. He said, you know, if I'm laying under my car and I'm working on my transmission and I'm thinking about God, that's worship. And I said, no, Brother Main, that's the farthest thing from worship. That's fixing your transmission. And I drew out this this application. I said, if you're laying under your car and you're working on that transmission, how is it possible for you to have your focus solely on God and on the transmission at the same time? How are you taking these gears and bolts and things apart? How are you figuring out what's wrong and what's right with that transmission? How are you processing all of these things that has to be processed mechanically if you're also worshiping God simultaneously? He thought about it for a minute and I said, then let's take your fixing your car worship and bring it into the assembly. If one can fix a transmission and worship God at the same time, now hear me. Why then do we tell people to turn off their cell phones and not to be talking and texting during the worship assembly? Why? If I can fix my transmission and worship God at the same time, I can text and worship God at the same time in the assembly. Why is it that, that we don't encourage people to turn and have conversations among themselves in the worship assembly? I mean, if I can fix my transmission, surely I can carry on a conversation with you and worship God at the same time. So why don't we encourage people to visit and talk during the worship assembly? Because our worship is intentional. Our, work is, our worship must require of us our, a focus and, listen, a commitment. What did Abraham say? Stay here while I go over there. Intentional, with a purpose. I'm going over there for a reason. I'm not staying here. I'm going over there for a reason to worship God. Now, the same thing is true for us. When you came here tonight, you came intentionally to worship God. You didn't come to surf the Internet. You didn't come to balance your checkbook. You didn't come to clip your fingernails. You didn't come to fix your makeup. You didn't come to address, address, uh, adjust your hair. You came to worship God. It's intentional. Some of the things that we give ourselves over to today in the worship assembly do, are everything but intentional. That we come together and we fail to realize that God must be our focus and the sole focus. And if we're not careful, it begins to be placed on this or that or this person or this thing that's going on. And we've lost that focus on God. I still maintain today that you can't fix your transmission and worship God acceptably at the same time. The same way I believe that you cannot sit there in that pew right now and balance your checkbook and worship God acceptably. You can't do it. God must be that sole focus. Let me give you another, another understanding. When we come before God, there should be a pattern in our worship. I, I suppose if there's one thing that brings out the ire, uh, the, 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 the angst, the frustration, uh, the, the uh, bitterness, and those who are opposed to uh, worship in spirit and truth today in the Lord's church, it's probably this last one. And you get labeled all kinds of, I've been called uh, a, a, a patternistic, um, I've been called um, all kinds of 1950s worship, you, you name it, I've been labeled everything. But the truth of the matter is, the Bible defines for us a pattern in, the New, Te in New Testament worship. Now, I didn't come up with this pattern, and I am 100% confident that you didn't come up with this pattern. And as we turn back to our source of authority, the Word of God, and we understand that our worship should be done orderly, and we come to the conclusion that it needs to have intention, the focus needs to be on God, it's not that far or difficult for us to understand that there needs to be a process, an avenue, a pattern to our worship. Well, we just don't come together and just sit here and stare at one another. There are avenues, there are acts. There's a direction in which our worship proceeds as we come together. Uh, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And notice these words in verse 13. 
Paul says, hold fast the pattern of sound words, which you have heard from me in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Paul says, hold fast the pattern of sound words. Some of you have a translation that says sound doctrine. But Paul gives us the understanding that it's not a bad thing to be patternistic. That it's not a bad thing to say that, listen, there are certain patterns, avenues that I hold to. And especially when it comes to my worship of God. Now I understand that if the focus and the intention is on what you like and what I like and what makes us excited and what pleases us, well then it becomes very hard to hold to the biblical pattern because we can't fit all those things in there. Why, if I'm going to worship God acceptably by His pattern, I've got to find a way to worship that, work in that baby dedication service. And if I'm going to worship God acceptably, then I have to find a way to, to find an authorization for hand clapping in our worship service. Or instrumental music in our worship service. Or a whole host of other uh, things that we want to bring in. The Bible lays out for us the understanding that in this pattern, there are ways that we can approach God. Avenues, acts that are certainly acceptable to him. And these are things, as Paul is saying here, that we ought not to be ashamed to hold fast to. Now these are things that are familiar to you. When we come into the presence of God, there is order, there is pattern to our worship in the sense that we offer to him singing. Brother Ron has been leading us in our singing tonight. Ephesians 5 and verse 19. That we sing and make melody in our heart. That we speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That we teach and admonish one another through song. Our singing goes in three directions. It goes up to God. It goes out to those who are hearing. We're teaching and admonishing. And it goes inward. Why, the very songs that I'm singing that, that praise God and teach those around me, well, certainly they teach me and admonish me as well. We see, secondly, that, that our worship involves prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17, pray without ceasing. Pray continually. Well, we've had men that have led us in prayer tonight. We didn't think it strange. We didn't think there was something wrong with these individuals that, that Ron stopped the singing and said, at this time, Brother Haskell is going to lead us in a word of prayer. Nobody jumped up and said, well, what is this crazy thing that you're doing? You've accepted the pattern because you understand the authority for the pattern. And we're led in prayer to God. We have a time when we come together in which there's preaching and there's teaching. Again, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. It's teaching and preaching which is based upon the word of God. It's what we use to teach, correct, rebuke, and train in righteousness. So we have that occasion in which we turn back to the word of God. And we say, what is it saying to us? What application can we make today? How can we be better, more faithful, stronger, more equipped? How can we help and serve one another? How can we love God more? We have that time of teaching and preaching. We don't think it's strange. We have a time of giving. We're told when it comes to our giving in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7 to do it cheerfully. We're told to do it in a way that we've purposed and planned in our heart. I'm not going to tell you what to give. But I would tell you that giving is a part of worship. We don't think that's strange. We understand that there's a time for us to gather around the Lord's table. A time to commemorate His death and what it means to us. It is a memorial that is confined to the church. It is unique to the church. You go back and do a study throughout the pages of Scripture. Go all the way back to the Old Testament and work your way forward. And you will find that people have always sung. You'll find that people have been a people of prayer. You'll see that there was teaching, preaching that was done. You'll see that people gave. But one thing stands out that is unique to the body of Christ today in our worship, and it is the memorial. It is gathering around the Lord's table. It's not something that we just throw in when we have time. It's something that is absolutely essential to that pattern of faithful, scriptural, New Testament worship. That we as a people come together and proclaim the Lord's death. It's unique to the kingdom. It's the very thing that Jesus said. Who is it, the question is asked, who should participate in the Lord's table? Those who are a body of Christ. Those who have been added to the church. Did not Jesus say, I won't partake of this again until I take it anew with you in my Father's kingdom? The kingdom and the church are synonymous. 
Who should take of the Lord's Supper? Every blood-bought Christian should participate in the memorial of Jesus Christ. For those who are outside of Christ, what, we do, what do we do? We teach them the importance of the memorial. We teach them how his death gives them life. I know that sounds odd when you first begin to explain to somebody, but when you talk to them about how they can live, you begin with how they can die. It's just so odd. But we teach them what the death of Jesus means and how it brings eternal life to them and how God so desperately wants all men to be saved and in wanting all men to be saved, providing that way for them to be saved and in providing that way for them to be saved, adding them to the church, the church which affords them the opportunity to remember this memorial, not quarterly, not bi-weekly, but on the gathering of the Lord's church on each Lord's day. Now you look at your calendar and it comes weekly. What a blessed people we are. I struggle then at times to understand why the worship wars. Why there's so much conflict. Why there's so much upheaval. Why there's so much discontent. Why there are those calling for us to revamp our worship. And throw out all these things that we've been doing for so many years. And have this fresh approach. It's fresh every Lord's Day. It's fresh every time we come into the presence of God. It's fresh and new and exciting. And it ought to be pleasing to Him. I know you've heard it enough between this morning and tonight. But when we begin to take our focus off of God and we put it on ourselves and what we want and what we think and what we like, we're losing sight of spirit and truth worship. And I grieve for those who have gone so far as to lose sight of anything that vaguely resembles acceptable New Testament worship. I want those brothers and sisters to come back to the authority and the order and the intention and the pattern. And I want them to have that worship in the presence of God in which they can walk away from that time of worship and know beyond all doubt that God was not only glorified, that God was not only uplifted, that God was not only the sole focus, but God was pleased. And He accepted their worship. I believe... I believe that how we worship matters so much that when we give ourselves over to unscriptural worship, not only is it unpleasing to God, but I believe it can affect our relationship with God to the point that we become apostates and we fall into error. And we will be held accountable for that. Friends, spirit and truth worship isn't something that Jesus gives to us in John chapter 4 and verse 23 and 24 and then says, go figure it out. Right? Spirit and truth worship isn't something that Jesus says in John chapter 4, 23 and 24 and says, well, this is what I want you to do, but I understand you're never going to get it. You're never going to be able to put it together. That's not what he's calling us to. Failure. He's calling us to do that which is pleasing to God. Desirous from God. And we simply need to be a people who do and to give and offer to God what he has asked for. Why, Brother Gellis? Because he's the creator and we're not. Because he has asked for worship in a certain way. And we as a people need to be in obedience to him. Do you worship God in truth? I hope so. I believe if you're attending here at the Northwest Church of Christ, you're worshiping God in spirit and truth. And I believe it becomes our responsibility. We're here for a, a, a short time. I've only been here for a year and a half. Some of you might have been here 50, 60 years. But listen, you're only here for a short time. A short time. So we have to do our part so that we can pass this on to the generation after us and to model for them spirit and truth worship so that they can continue to be acceptable to God. That's our responsibility. And with the short time that we have here, ought we to do that? Shouldn't we be a people who say, listen, I want to pass on to those who are coming after me that which is acceptable to God and not that which is displeasing to Him? I think we all want that. Then let us always do that. Spirit and truth worship.
Is that how you worship? Brother Ron's got a song of invitation for us. I get excited and talk loud. I'm not yelling at you. I, I love you. I just get excited. But Brother Ron's going to lead us in our song of invitation. And listen, if you're here tonight, I know you hear invitations at the ending of all these messages. And you, 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 you might just think, oh, well, that's just another, another invitation. But listen, I, I think it means something. The opportunity for us to pray with you and for you. The opportunity for us to encourage you. An opportunity to make a, meet, a need known. Well, we, we love to do that. We might have some here tonight who, who realize that they want to worship God in spirit and truth. And they know that one of the things that they need to do first and foremost is become a child of God. Be our great privilege to join with you as you're clothed with Christ in obedience to the gospel plan of salvation. To hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized. And we'd love to rejoice with you as you're added to the church by God himself. How can we help you? If you're subject to the invitation, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus.